service as well. And this is from Psalm 116. So listen to the word of the Lord. For thou hast delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I kept my faith, even when I said, I am greatly afflicted. I said in my consternation, humans are all of vain hope. What shall I render to the Lord for all his bounty to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I like that, lift up the cup of salvation. That's like I'm going to make a toast to my Savior. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints or his godly ones. O Lord, I am thy servant. I am thy servant, the daughter of thy handmaid. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Eternal and ever-loving God, we bless you for the great company of all those who have kept the faith, have finished their race, and who now rest from their labor. We praise you for those dear to us whom we draw to heart and mind and name before you in our prayers now. And especially, Father, we thank you for Sarah, for Nani, whom you have now received into your presence with all your saints. And we ask now that as we gather in this place that you would help us to believe where we have not seen, trusting you to lead us through all of our days and years to come, and that you by your grace would bring us at last with all your saints into the joy of your home through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We have scripture readings, and Brooklyn, Ruthann, and Abigail will help us hear the word of the Lord. There's Brooke there. Come on up. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being just a man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary your wife, for that which is conceived in her as the Holy Spirit, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this will, all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet saying behold the virgin shall be with child and bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel which that translated God with us then Joseph being aroused from sleep did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. John 14, 1 through 9. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, 
that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? John 14, 25 through 27. All this I have spoken while still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will, will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Philippians 4, 6 through 9. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer, prayer and attention with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, and anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it, in, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Amen. Matthew 7, 7 through 12. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Or what man is there among you? Who, if his son asks for bread, will you give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will you give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? Therefore, whatever you want men to do, be, be also to them. This, for this is the law and the prophets. And then finally, from Paul's letter to the church in Rome in the 8th chapter, we read that we know that in everything God works good with those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. For those who he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And those whom he predestined, he also called and those who he called, he also justified. And those he, who he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, will he not also give us all things with him? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? If it is God who justifies, who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised from the dead, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us, and who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? For it is written, for thy sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor anything else 
and all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As I said when we gathered, it's a supreme honor to be officiating at my mother-in-law's uh, homegoing. Uh, typically, son-in-laws tell jokes about their mother-in-laws, and they're not usually very flattering. I was not able to do that because I got the best mother-in-law anyone could ask for. Um, 98 years is a long time to live and to celebrate her life appropriately. We may have to call out for lunch and then do an intermission and come back again in the afternoon to do it justice. But we do gather here for the amount of time that we will commit for this purpose and uh, it can't all be encapsulated in this time. I mean, there's stories that have already been shared there's laughter, there's tears, and that's gonna continue, but we're gonna pause for this brief moment and, um, and see if we can do justice to a uh, incredible lady who lived an incredible life and displayed uh, an amazing faith in a loving God. You know, it has been said that life is a gift and that death is a certainty and even as a pastor, I can say that life beyond this life um, is beautiful, but it's mysterious. We don't know much about what comes after this life, but we know there is a life beyond this life because it's been promised to us, and Jesus made that promise. But if there's anything that we do know about life beyond this life, or about heaven, if you will, we know three things. We know that Jesus is there. We know that there are angels and that those who have gone before us are there. We can be sure about those three things. I don't know about streets of gold. I don't know about lush golf courses or beautiful fishing holes or whatever your penchant would be. But we do know that we will see our Savior. Angels sing His praises continuously and that we will see our loved ones. Um, the other thing that I, want to, that I want to mention here is that it's been said that, when a, that the way that a person dies is, in a sense, a mirror of how they lived. So the way a person dies is a mirror of how they lived. I don't know if that's true or not, but I think the case could be made that that is accurate with Nani. Um, as we have told stories and will continue to tell stories, and Chad and Rachel know, firsthand and Jeannie as well and others who were there that um, um, Nani was uh, was very peaceful um, but she had also um, experienced um, maybe people visiting her which is not unusual when people approach death that that she had seen others come to her in those last hours, that last day, and she had even heard people calling her name. Isn't that right? And they were calling her name, Nani. And she said, can't you hear them? It's loud. And, and there were people calling her name. But we, but we also, we know that, but also, um, as, as uh, I discovered last night, when Nani actually died, there were a lot of people in the room. I was surprised by that. Chad said there were like 10 people in the room. Rachel, Chad, Jeannie, Doroth, people from Hardis were there. Betty had been on the phone with her, um, it, but it was a, a room full of people and um, it was quite a send off. It, it, was, it was quite a send off. And I think that's so appropriate for the way that Nani lived because she loved people so much and I think she, Relish the fact that she was surrounded by people she loved and people who loved her and had spoken to her and been with her even there right before the end. Um, the other thing I want to say is, is Christmas time is a, um, a bittersweet time to have to acknowledge the death of a loved one um, because you know we're celebrating 
uh, the joy of the season, but this is a difficult time. We're, we're talking about the light of the world, but these are the longest nights and the darkest days. We're, we're celebrating a birth, but here we are recognizing a, a death. We're, um, we're in this juxtaposition between finding something like the shepherds and the wise men found the Christ child, but we're also juxtaposing that and losing something, losing Nani's physical presence with us. Um, we're getting presence, but we're also giving away. And there are blessings in this season, but we're also giving our loved one back to the one who gave her to us. And so in this, there's celebrating and there is grieving. And we have to acknowledge that Nani, although she was so small, but you know that diamonds and dynamite comes in small packages. She was so small, but she lives, she leaves such a big hole. And we need to acknowledge that. And as we acknowledge that, that large hole, we can fill it with other things. And we're going to fill it with, with more of our own lives as we live in and more of our own relationships that, that we will enjoy and grow. The other thing I want to say is that with Nani's death, we're all getting a promotion because she was the last of this generation to die. Um, and, and so everybody moves up a notch now. And, 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 and it's time to move up in terms of, you know, our roles and responsibilities and, and to embrace those opportunities because there's more on us now. I mean, that's what maturing and growing is all about. It's been said that you don't really become an adult until your parents die. And so it's time for us to grow up in a sense. So what do we do in the face of all of this? Well, I want us to celebrate what was to give thanks for what is, and to hope and pray for what will be. As I said, Nani was uh, the last of this generation. She was the youngest of the Bernard girls, um, Elizabeth being the oldest. Mary was next, and Judy, uh, Mary's daughter, is here. Thank you for your presence. And then there was Edna. We've got Henry and um, representatives from that piece of the family. And then of course, Nani was the youngest. She was probably spoiled. Who was she? We celebrate the fact that she was the wife of Lynn Lemon for 66 years. What, what a picture of faithfulness and tolerance between the two of them. <laughs> she was a mother of three girls, Betty and Barbara and Jean. She was the grandmother of Chad and Rachel and Abigail and Ruth Ann. She was also a, a, a great grandmother of Kylie and Corey and Nathan and Joe and Brooklyn. Um, she was a volunteer. She was a, a librarian. She was a beauty queen. She was a, an officer in her, her student days in, in high school. Um, but one of the things that we want to remember and celebrate about Nani is that she was a Christian. And, and she would want us to remember that because that was something that was at the core of everything that she was. Um, she gave her life to Jesus Christ at a church camp, at a Plymouth Brethren church camp, back in 1938 when she was 14 years old. She professed Jesus as Savior and was baptized. And she wanted me to mention this fact on this occasion because it was important to her and it was important to her that you know that it was important to her. She was a lot of things and we could go on and on, but um, one of the things that she wasn't was perfect. She, she was not perfect and I don't think she tried to be but she did live like a Christ follower most of the time, a redeemed saint and a forgiven sinner. Um, sometimes she would tell you how she really felt about them <laughs> and what she thought of them, and it wasn't always flattering. Um, she had been known to stick out her tongue at people where they could see it and behind their backs. Um, 
she just recently, um, I don't know if this is a thing that she did during her lifetime, but, but uh, Betty sent her some gifts that needed to be distributed to some people um, that were helping care for her. And Nadi claimed that somebody had opened the gift when it arrived at Hardest and took out some things from the box. And they needed to get to the bottom of this. But we came to find out that it was Nani who opened the gift and took those things out. <laughs> and it may have been because she didn't want the person who was going to receive that gift to actually get it because she didn't think they deserved it. We also know that um, we know that Nani knew how to take care of people who weren't being nice and who weren't sharing, like allowing other people to work puzzles at hardest. It's been reported that she wanted to teach them a lesson by borrowing some of the pieces of the puzzle. Um, I still don't believe that she actually meant to take those pieces. I think they fell off the table and it happened to be like, you know, on her, on her chair or in her lap. But anyway, those, those ladies are still looking for those puzzle pieces. <laughs> Nani wasn't perfect, but she was authentic. He knew exactly who she was. And it was a beautiful picture. The other thing we know about Nani is that she was loving. Everybody in this room knows that Nani loved you. And she knew how to show it. It might be making your favorite dish or pastry or banana pudding by not leaving you alone and finding you wherever you were, she was gonna track you down because she loved you. She was gonna call you incessantly until you returned the call because she loved you. She always wanted to know how you were doing, what you were doing. That's Betty. <laughs> but Betty was asking those questions too several times a day. We also know that uh, there, were, there was something that you uh, needed to know about Nani and never do, and that was get in the way of her meal time or her bingo game. Don't mess with it. And we each have our Nani memories or moments and stories. There's so much to remember, to celebrate, to cherish. And we are all here now and will continue to thank God for Sarah and who she was and who we knew her to be. There's one thing in particular that we can all celebrate, celebrate um, and I want to highlight is Sarah's prayer life. I'm a pastor and I am envious of how she prayed for others, for herself, and for each one of you. You know she prayed for you. You know she prayed for you. By the way she lived, it makes me want to be a better Christian. It makes me want to be a better prayer, a more faithful follower, a more bold person in my faith. And Nani learned this at a young age, and she practiced it her whole life. We can look at her life and we can discover that the more we pray, the more peace we experience, the more gratitude we can express, the easier it is for us to let go of things and to trust God, or as the Bible says, to cast all our cares upon the Lord for he cares for you. In prayer, we come to know as Nani did that the person that we are praying to is a good father who wants to give good gifts to his children. We have a good father that takes care of us as his children, like he takes care of the flowers of the field and the, the birds of the air. He did this for Nani her whole life. She never lacked for anything. Nani prayed without ceasing. I believe she gave thanks in all things, not for all things. She didn't thank God for all things, but she thanked God in all things. Nani prayed 
And she prayed about the big things. Probably about the loss of her father when she was only five years old. The loss of her daughter, Barbara. She prayed. The loss of little Jack. She prayed. The loss of her life mate, Glenn. She prayed in the big things. But you know what? She also prayed in the smallest of things. She knew that she could ask God for anything. When Jeannie and the girls and I were here for Thanksgiving, and it was absolutely wonderful. It was absolutely wonderful. Great trip. But Chad had said, you know, the weather's not good. If it's going to be raining, she may not want to go. But um, she did. She made the effort. And uh, sure enough, on Thanksgiving, it was raining like a rip. And Nani was having trouble ambulating, getting around. She would get from her scooter to her chair or her chair to the scooter to the bed and in and out of the car. But we got her out to the car and we got her in the car under the portage at Hardis. And we drove. And we, we got to the house and it rained, it was raining the whole way. And Nani was sitting in the front seat. And uh, as we were driving over there, I'm dodging these big, these big puddles because Houston's about three feet under sea level anyway. It floods here. But we were driving there and I looked over and Nani was in the front seat. She had her head bowed and her eyes closed. And I said, Nani, are you doing okay? And she said, yes. I said, are you taking a nap? She said, no, I'm praying. I said, is my driving that bad? <laughs> she said, no, I'm praying that the Lord would make the rain stop. So we got to the house. Chad comes out. It's raining. He's getting wet. I backed the car into the driveway. And I kid you not, by the time we got out of the car, got the wheelchair to the door, it stopped raining. And Nani went inside. We had about two hours of a beautiful Thanksgiving celebration. I said, Nani, are you ready to go? Yes, I'm ready. And she was. She was tired. But you know, the whole time we were in the house, you could hear the rain on the roof. It had been raining the whole time we were in the house. And then when we pushed her out the front door, Nani dropped the rain. She got in the car. It started raining again. And it rained the whole way back to Hardis. And right, I kid you not, I've got witnesses. Right when we turned off of, what's the name of it? Highway 3. Highway 3 into Hardest, when the tires touched the pavement of the Hardest property, the rain stopped. And I said, look at there, girls. It stopped raining and not missing a beat. Nani said, that's what you get when you pray. We celebrate all of these things. And we give thanks for what is now. And what is now is what Brooklyn read us. This is the Christmas season. And we are celebrating what is now, and that is the gift of Christ child, whose name is Emmanuel. We're celebrating that God is with us. And as the Lord was with Nani, so the Lord will be with us in our lives, in our relationships, in our hopes, our dreams, our challenges, our disappointments, our plans, our futures. And we can talk to him about every piece of it. Because Paul wrote, be not anxious about anything. Ruth Ann read it. Be not anxious about anything. But let your requests be made known to God with thanksgiving. And then the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And so we give thanks for the promise of this peace from Jesus himself. And it's a peace that the world does not understand. It's a peace that only Jesus himself can give. My friends and I had that peace. The peace of Jesus himself. The love of her heavenly father that sustained her. And the other thing that we can give thanks for that is right now is that this is also a love and a presence that can never be taken away from us. For Paul also wrote, 
And we read this, I am confident that in life and in death and nothing in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And that's what we can give thanks for right now. That presence, that peace from which we can never be separated. And that, my friends, is also our hope for the future. So how do we go forward? We have someone we can depend on, come what may. Come what may. We have someone we can depend on. Nani also requested that the song, It Is Well With My Soul, would be sung at this service, and Kylie is going to do that in just a moment. And there's a story behind this song that I think is worth bringing to our uh, understanding. If you know it, I'll refresh your memory. If not, you need to know the story behind this song that Nani requested. It was written by a man named Horatio Spafford, who is a Chicago businessman. And he lost his son at a very tender age to an illness. And then if you know the history of Chicago, there was a great fire. And Horatio Spafford lost his business in this great fire. And so in the wake of this, the family planned to make a trip to England. Spafford was married to a man, or excuse me, he was married to a woman named Anna. And they had four daughters. And so he sent his wife and his four daughters ahead to go to England, and he would join them when his business had finished what he had to tend to. It was on that voyage that the ship that his wife and four daughters were on was struck by another vessel in the Atlantic, and it sank. It killed 226 people, and four of them were the daughters of Horatio Stafford. His wife sent him a telegram when she safely reached England that simply said, saved alone. And so as Horatio Spafford traveled from the United States across the Atlantic to England, he told the captain of that ship, I want to know where my daughters were killed. And so the captain came to him and alerted him that they were passing over that very spot of water where his daughters had died. And it was there, standing on the bow of the ship, that Horatio Spafford was inspired to write, When peace like a river attended my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Nani wants you to know that it was well with her soul and it is well with her soul and she also she also wants you to know that it will be well with your soul as well and she even wrote in her notes ask is it well with your soul is it, I didn't say, is it perfect with your soul? Is everything as you want it to be with your soul? No, is it well? Are you at peace? Do you know your loving Father? Do you know that He is with you? Do you know He will never leave you? Do you know that He wants good for you? And He has shown us his goodness in his son Jesus. Because, because Nani, because of Nani's faith, she knew that she was going to be okay. It was going to be well. And she prayed, and she, I believe, is praying for you that you will know that it is well and will be well with you also. I think that it's this peace in her soul that made her so lovable to the very end. Now remember I talked about Nani's death and all the people that were in the room with her. 
What a send-off. But, my friends, my family, I don't think her send-off is any comparison to the reception that she has experienced. For all those who were waiting for her and now celebrate with her in that glad reunion that is promised to us all. They have welcomed her home. We can let her go and know that it is well with her and it will be with us as well because of our loving Father. And we give him thanks. Amen.
hear the whole company of heaven cheering. And Sarah writing, thank you kindly. Let's, uh, let's turn to God in prayer now and uh, we'll conclude the prayer with the Lord's Prayer and it's printed in the order of service and so we don't stumble over debts and trespassers. We'll uh, ask for forgiveness of our sins and those who sin against us, but let's go to the Lord in prayer. Oh God, you're so good. You're so loving. You're so faithful. You're so present. And you never leave us. May we feel your presence in strong and very real and fresh ways. As life has now changed. And a hole exists in us that can be filled only by you and by the love of those that you place in our lives. But it is well with our souls. Thank you for this peace and this promise that you sustain us all of our days. And as we leave this place, we are going to thank you here and repeatedly for all your servants who having lived this life in faith now live eternally with you. And we're especially thanking you for your servant, Sarah. Her baptism is now complete in death because she has been raised from the waters of baptism into a new life. And we praise you for the gift of her life that she lived here so faithfully and the life that she now lives eternally with you and all those who have gone before us. And we thank you for everything in her that was so good and kind and faithful and mischievous and little devious and just fun. Thank you. Thank you for the grace that you gave her that kept stirring up her love for your dear name and your church and for those you placed in her life. We thank you that her death is past. We thank you that she has now entered into the joy that you have prepared for her through Christ Jesus our Lord. We thank you that in Jesus Christ you promised that there are many rooms in your house, plenty of room. And so we ask that you would give us now faith as we walk our earthly way until that day that we would enter your house, that you would show us beyond touch or sight some sure sign of your kingdom. And where our eyes cannot see, that we would be able to step out in faith and trust your love which never fails. And now by your Holy Spirit, we recognize and acknowledge our grief, but you're going to lead us through the shadow of the valley of death because you're with us. And weeping may endure for the night, but we know that your joy comes in the morning. And it is you, Holy Spirit, that will lift our heavy sorrow and give us good hope in Jesus so that we may now stand up and walk our earthly way that you have planned for each one of us because it's good. You have good plans for us. And as we walk our earthly way, we look forward to the glad reunion in the life to come through Jesus Christ our Lord. He is the one to whom we pray and who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And as you're able to stand, you may do so for the words of the commendation. You only are immortal, the creator and maker of all, and we are mortal, formed of the earth, and to the earth we shall return. And this you ordained when you created us, saying you are dust, and to dust you shall return. 
And all of us go down to the dust, yet even at the grave we make our song. We can sing at the grave because we know our Savior is risen. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. So give rest, O Christ, to your servant with all your saints, where there is neither pain nor sorrow nor crime, but life everlasting. And into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant, Sarah. Acknowledge, we humbly pray, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive her into the arms of your mercy and into the blessed rest of everlasting peace and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his face to shine upon you and give you peace and all God's children peace today and forevermore. Amen. As you're able, we'll make our way to the graveside. Please join us.